Well, I invite you you to open your Bibles, brothers and sisters, to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is perhaps a book that we don't spend much time in. We may not know it very well. We know one passage in particular. We love to sing, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. And you may know that that passage is found here in this very book. And so in order to prepare ourselves to hear the word preached, let us now take some time to read from the book of Lamentations, and then we will couple that with a reading from, a short reading from the book of Hebrews. I always like to tie the two covenants together, how we can see how one informs the other. One is fulfilled in the other, and so... We come to Lamentations 3. Our text is verses 21 through 26. For context, I'll begin reading at verse 20. Lamentations 3.20. Let us hear the word of the Lord. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new Every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. Keep your marker there in Lamentations, but we'll turn over quickly to the book of Hebrews and then come back to Lamentations. We, our reading is from Hebrews chapter 10. Just a few verses here that show us the working out of these promises in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 14. Speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit inspires the author to write, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, For he who promised is faithful. We end that reading with the word faithful and then make our way back to Lamentations 3 where we read about God's great faithfulness in Christ. Now brothers and sisters, we sometimes as Christians are, we are not, as Calvin said, stocks and blocks or as the canons of Dort put it, There is no sin in sadness. Sadness can develop into sin, but in sadness itself, there is no sin. There is no sin in brokenheartedness. One of the books of the Bible is titled Lamentations. It is a book of laments. It is written by one named by many, the weeping prophet. We saw Christ. Our mind's eyes can go to the the tomb of Lazarus, and there we picture our Savior weeping 
at the grave of Lazarus, even though he knows that momentarily he will say, Lazarus, come forth from that grave. Lamenting is a reality for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in this fallen world from time to time. We remember that David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, wrote many songs and psalms of lament. We find ourselves now in the book of Lamentations and we are reminded of the cause of his laments, which you know, if you have read the book a few times, you know the cause. One commentator reminds us that this is the third in a series of poems written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by the prophet Jeremiah. This well-known passage, I'm quoting this commentator, the well-known passage concerning the compassions of God stands at the center of this poem. In verse 21 we read, He has walled me in. The poet's hopelessness reaches its climax in verses 16 through 18 when he says that he has lost his peace or the sense of well-being that should have been the mark of a healthy relationship between God and his people. When, however, the poet dwells on his condition, his thoughts turn to hope, just as those of the psalmist, as he gives rein to his memory, then his mind turns to God's past goodness, end quote. And so here we come to this passage under the theme 21 through 26, Great is Thy Faithfulness, borrowing from the title of that great hymn. We see this in three ways, the faithfulness of Yahweh. First, Yahweh's loving, that is to say, let me change my emphasis. I hope you have an outline that was there by the bulletins. First, Yahweh's loving faithfulness. Second, Yahweh's endless faithfulness. And third, Yahweh's faithfulness to those who wait. We'll consider those one at a time. I say that I use the word Yahweh because that is the Scripture, that is what the Scripture calls him here in this passage, Jehovah, Yahweh. First then, Yahweh's loving faithfulness. The key verse in this passage is verse 23, upon which that blessed hymn is based that we will sing at the end of the service, God willing. As we examine the faithfulness of God, this one particular attribute held out for us here by the prophet and by the Holy Spirit through him, we... It is, as it were, a, like a diamond or a, a, a jewel that has many facets. And as we turn the, the jewel, we see the various aspects of God's faithfulness. Each verse demonstrates another aspect of that covenant faithfulness on the part of our covenant God. We begin at verse 20. The, the apostle, the uh, prophet begins with on a somber note as we noted already my soul still remembers and sinks within me the if you remember your history of Israel and Judah the prophet Jeremiah lived in a time when the people were so incensed at the word of God and so given over to idolatry in the main that they actually took the prophet of God and threw him into a dungeon where he sank in mud up to his armpits and would have perished if no one had come to his rescue. And no wonder his soul sank within him even as he himself sank into the mud on one occasion. And yet, in the midst of that sadness, as our commentator has already reminded us, now the Holy Spirit influences, is, influences him to turn his mind away from his despair, away from that sinking feeling in his soul, and to recall to mind the great faithfulness of our covenant God, even in the midst of terrible circumstances like his. This covenant faithfulness he recalls to mind. And therefore, he says, I have hope. I've already given you the answer to the question, what does the word this refer to? What is the referent of this? Therefore, I have hope this equals Yahweh's mercy. He calls to mind that Yahweh, the covenant God, will remember the affliction of his people. He will remember that remnant in Israel and Judah that he has set aside for himself. 
And brothers and sisters, as we think of our own situation now, all these centuries later, in a, in a culture that is becoming increasingly hostile to our covenant God, in Christ, Yahweh continues, the triune God continues to restore his covenant people from despair to hope when we turn to him for help. Ironically, the Holy Spirit causes hope to rise out of despair when we draw close to our Father. We're going to see that in many ways in this passage. When we draw close to our Father with a sense of our own weaknesses, He causes hope to arise even, from us, even as our souls perhaps sink within us from time to time. Yahweh's loving faithfulness. The, now in verse 21, the, the, the prophet's mind turns away from his own despair and begins to focus on God's faithfulness and he considers the fact, this aspect of hope in the faithfulness of God. That because our triune God is always faithful and never unfaithful, there is always hope in Him. And so in verse 22 we read, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. Through the mercies of Yahweh we are not consumed. Notice the language there. It is not through the mercy singular of the, our triune God, but through the mercies plural of our triune God. He's going to say, he's going to elaborate on that very fact momentarily. There is a difference, a subtle difference perhaps, between mercy and compassion. And the text will help us to flesh that out. The language of the text uses both words. Notice the language again. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Pause. Because His compassions fail not. His mercies prevent us from being consumed by His wrath and anger because of our dis disobedience. And the root of that mercy is the fact that His compassions never fail. One translation translates it this way, the steadfast love of the Lord. Through the steadfast love of the Lord, we are not consumed. To put it simply, sometimes people get confused. It's very easy for Christians to be confused between the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You can think of mercy as a negative, perhaps, and grace as a positive. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's what we have in Christ. Mercy is a negative. Not getting what you do deserve. And the, the prophet speaks of the plentiful and abundant and manifold and many mercies of the Lord our God because his mercies are manifold and without number we as sinners are not consumed the word consumed there means to be cut off we're not cut off from God we're not cut off from Christ our guilt is there always we we stand before God before he works his grace in us as guilty and polluted sinners worthy of an eternity in hell we are we're guilty and polluted. We stand before the bar of judgment with a verdict rendered guilty. And yet, because of His mercies, He does not give us what we deserve. And the Lord's Supper, once again, points us to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, where we see the greatest mercy of all. That the mercies that are extended us through Christ, because God poured that wrath that we deserved as sinners on His Son as our substitute, so that we could have mercy so that we would not be consumed as we justly deserve because of our sins. We receive those mercies, the, the writer reminds us, because the compassions of Yahweh never fail. Now, to flesh out that difference between mercy and compassion, we think of compassion perhaps the best 
synonym that we have in our language for compassion is the word sympathy. The sympathies of our Lord never fail. We are told in the book of Hebrews that we have a high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities or is sympathetic toward us in our weaknesses. Great is the loving faithfulness of our covenant God. We see the compassion of Christ also as we think of his broken body and shed blood extended to us. First of all, before he ever went to the cross, we see the compassion of Christ extended toward us in his obedience. We read the law of God again today, didn't we? And we're convicted of of the fact that we've broken his law, even as Christians. We've not kept his commandments perfectly. We've committed sins of omission and sins of commission since we last came to the table of the Lord. But we have a substitute in God's great mercy and compassion. He provides for us. He looks down upon us guilty sinners and he provides a substitute who perfectly keeps every one of those Ten Commandments, every commandment ever written in the entire text of Scripture, Jesus kept perfectly. That's his active obedience. And then we see his passive obedience, his compassion toward us by virtue of his going to the cross, passively submitting himself to the will of the Father, allowing himself to be cursed on that tree, taking upon himself the guilt and pollution of of every one of his elect. Then we see the compassion of Christ displayed in his resurrection when he conquers death and sin and the power of the devil. Then we see the passion of the compassion of our Lord and Savior as he ascends into heaven and sits there at the right hand of God as our compassionate and faithful high priest interceding for us where he ever lives to make intercession for us. That's just a taste of the compassion of our God, which ends up, results in his manifold mercies. But the writer wants us to, as we think about the compassion of our triune God, the writer by inspiration wants us to consider the fact that these compassions of his never fail. That's good news, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Does your compassion sometimes fail? Does my compassion sometimes fail? Does my mercy and your mercy sometimes fail? But the fathers, the sons, the Holy Spirit, their compassions never fail. He is immutable. He is unchangeable in this too, in this attribute of compassion. His compassionate acts toward His people will never fail. They will never cease. And therefore, we are not consumed by His wrath. And this results in that doctrine, the pea and tulip, the perseverance of the saints. We persevere by grace through faith in Christ, not because we are stronger than other Christians, not because of our own meager efforts we persevere because his compassions fail not the reformation study bible reflecting on this verse says god's covenant devotion is always joined with his compassion though the lord may withhold mercy temporarily that is not the end of the story his people are not finally consumed because god's compassion is not consumed. God's wrath toward his people must come to an end because his compassion cannot fail. End quote. Great is the loving faithfulness of our covenant God. And so, as we come to the table of the Lord again this day, may Christ give you hope of glorious days ahead. May he give you hope by calling to mind on a regular basis the mercies of His Son so that you do not get what you deserve because of His obedience, because of His crucifixion, because of His resurrection, because of His ascension, because of His session. May He give you the grace of the Holy Spirit, dear ones, to rejoice that His mercies will never end 
His compassions will never fail. And therefore, you and I, by God's grace, Christian, brother and sister, will never be consumed. May, you, may He give you hope by calling to mind His compassionate acts of grace toward you in His Son. That's the first thing. Yah, Yahweh's loving faithfulness. And the second is like it. Yahweh's endless faithfulness. We had a little taste of that already, haven't we? But verses 23 and 24 bring that out more fully. The, the, as if he is building one, and this is common in Hebrew poetry, my Old Testament professor used to call it staircase poetry, where you take one step and then another and then another building upon going up the stairs as it were. And so as he mentions the fact that the compassions of God never fail, it leads him to say more about the endless faithfulness of our covenant God. Because if his faithfulness should ever come to an end, we would, as the apostle says, be of all men most miserable. And yet at the same time, the, the prophet says to us that his faithfulness in one sense, though God is unchangeable, though God is immutable, in one sense his faithfulness is new every morning. Verse 23. They are new every morning by the mercies of Christ Jesus. Because of his mercies we are not consumed. Why? Because his mercies are renewed day after day after month after year, after decade, after century. God, this address to God now, in this, it marks uh, an, an intimacy with God. That He is unquali without qualification, completely and totally reliable and therefore worthy of our faith. His compassions and His mercies are new daily. Not new in the sense of et His eternal decree. Not as though He is, wakes up one morning and thinks, what m great mercy can I show today? Not new in the sense of radically different from something He has done before, but new in the terms of our experience. That is, when you wake up tomorrow morning, and you begin to go through your work day and your work week, you will experience new mercies from God because it is a different day. It is a different time of life. It is a different week. There are different circumstances. And in those circumstances, you will experience a newness of God's mercies and grace. And this is a direct result of your union with Christ Jesus by faith, by grace. They're new every morning, he says. They're not just new on Sunday mornings. This is not just something that happens once a week. Notice the language. They are not, they are new every week. They are new every morning. Think of these daily acts of mercy and compassion towards you, brothers and sisters, that are not experienced by your neighbors, by your friends, by your relatives, by your co workers who are not Christians. Every morning, you have the Holy Spirit to comfort you. Every morning, you have the Holy Spirit to convict you. That's mercy. That's compassion. They go about their business with no conviction or very little unless they are caught. You have every morning the assurance that if today were to be my last day, I should be to absent from the body but present with the Lord. You have every day the mercy of a sense of His loving care for you because you are His child and He is your Father. You have a sense every morning of His fatherly love. As the psalmist expressed it in 35, verse 5, for His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. His mercies are endless because his compassions are endless. A commentator writes, Because love and compassion are the chief attributes of God, they are always fresh, ready to be proved and known again. For this reason, those who have been afflicted may always put their trust in him again for their acceptance and restoration. End quote. 
New mourning, new trials, yes. God gives us the grace to see. And may he more and more give us the grace to see, beloved, that he is the ultimate designer of all our trials. Sometimes in our weakness we say, why me? Why did this happen to me? I know other Christians who are much less faithful than I. They don't have to experience what I do. But he has custom designed your trials, your afflictions for you as his unique child. Though he causes grief, verse 32 says, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Our Father may have to take us to the woodshed once in a while, but though he causes grief, he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. And so no wonder the psalmist then lets out this doxology and this exclamation of praise, great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father. And so, congregation, as we come to the table of the Lord again, may your Father again this week give you great hope in and because of His great faithfulness by convincing you and giving you confidence in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Confidence that His compassions toward you, His mercies toward you are renewed daily and every morning. May He give you a renewed assurance, brothers and sisters, that in your grievous trials, His faithfulness is greater than you can ever imagine or even believe. May He comfort you, brothers and sisters, with knowing that His faithfulness, praise God, is not dependent on your faithfulness or mine. There is an assurance that, we, that comes by the faithfulness of God. Again, we're looking at the various aspects of this beautiful jewel of God's fake faithfulness. And another aspect of it is the f- assurance that comes to us through His faithfulness. Verse 24, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in Him. Since God is faithful, Since God is immutable and unchanging in that faithfulness, we can be content by His grace that God is our portion. That may sound like strange language to your ear. It was not strange to the ear of an Israelite because every Israelite knew which tribe was his. He knew which piece of real estate belonged to his tribe. They were apportioned out, you remember, under the rule of Joshua. But that was just a type and a foreshadowing of what we experience in the New Covenant. We don't have a piece of real estate divided to us. We don't have, I remember one, uh, one pastor uh, that um, my pastor had heard of back in, this was way back in the 70s, he was a dispensationalist and he was convinced that, of course, that the next stage after the Uh, church age that we're in now would be the kingdom that would be set up for a thousand years and that we would rule and reign with Christ on this earth for a thousand years and that his conviction was this pastor dispensationalist pastor was he said I'm not going to settle for anything less than mayor of Los Angeles that was his hope for his portion and his allotment that's not what this scripture is talking about is it The allotment that has been allotted to you is the fact that He is your God in Christ, that you are His people, that daily He gives you His grace and spirit, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Psalm 16.5 says it this way, O Lord, You are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The Lord is our allotment. The Lord, Jehovah, the triune God is our allotment, our portion, our inheritance. And He maintains that inheritance. You know how that can be. Perhaps it comes to the end of an ancestor's life and you're expecting some kind of inheritance and it something goes wrong. Something goes haywire. Maybe the state seizes the property. Maybe 
uh, there's some unforeseen problem and some, the, the, the thing falls apart. Not with the Lord. He maintains our lot. We need the grace of the Holy Spirit to put all our hope in Christ, to seek His blessing above all other things. Great is His endless faithfulness. John Calvin wrote this about this verse. Let us bear in mind this truth, that all our thoughts will ever wander and go astray until we are fully persuaded that God alone is sufficient for us so that He may become alone our heritage. For all who are not satisfied with God alone are immediately seized with impatience whenever famine oppresses them or sword threatens them or any other grievous calamity, end quote. Remember then that the Apostle Paul is inspired to write in this same vein, Romans 8, 31, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, if he's our inheritance, if he's our lot, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, no created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Calvin again, that whatever might happen, we would not yet cease to glory in Him. Why? Because God is our life and death, our light and darkness, our rest and war and tumult, our abundance in penury and want, end quote. So, beloved, may he, he give your souls the grace to say with confident assurance, because I belong to Christ. The Lord is my portion, and therefore I hope in Him. That's the second thing, His endless faithfulness. His loving faithfulness, His endless faithfulness. The third thing in verses 25 and 6 is His faithfulness to those who wait on Him. So far, we've been focusing mostly on the vertical, we might say. What God is and what God does. This verse presses us to the horizontal. Yes, His faithfulness is loving, exceedingly loving. His faithfulness is endless. But His faithfulness is expressed and sensed most candidly and pointedly by those who wait on Him. That's the theme of 25 and 6. That His faithfulness is demonstrated, first of all, in His goodness. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for Him. Eventually, the Lord shows and demonstrates His goodness to all who hope in Him, in Christ. It may be hard sometimes to understand why, how can this event, this lot, this allotment, this portion, this day, week, month, year, be possibly good for me. But the soul that seeks after the, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, freely admits how much he or she needs the mercy and the grace of God every day. And since he is so good to you, since you know that by his grace, the, this passage ex calls you to express your gratitude to him with all your soul. Because the Lord is good for those who wait for him. So let us draw near, Hebrews says, with a true heart full of assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So may the Father give you the grace to see the compassionate, the tender heart of your great high priest, and may he renew your assurance that he is indeed good to those who wait for him. Whatever He has ordained for you, brother and sister, is right and is good. I realize I don't know what He has ordained for you right now or in this season of your life. But on the authority of Scripture, I can proclaim to you and declare to you that whatever He has ordained for you is right and is good. 
but may he give you confidence for the future as you cling to that promise. May he give you confidence that this church belongs to him and that he always does what is best for her. May he give you confidence for your children and your grandchildren. May he give you the grace to patiently wait for him to bless Grace Church in the month and the years ahead. May he give you grace to seek him more than you have been. Salvation comes through his faithfulness. Another aspect as we turn the jewel. Not only is there hope in this faithfulness of our covenant God, but there is also salvation. The word salvation is used, of course, often in Scripture to describe our redemption in Christ. But it's also used to describe rescue of God's people from time to time. Verse 26 reads this way, It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Again, you see the staircase? He just spoke of waiting on the Lord. Now we take the next step, and he says, As we wait, it is good that one should hope and wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good to patiently and quietly wait in our troubles until God rescues us. Calvin again, if you will. He teaches the need of patience, as also the apostle does. For otherwise, there can be no faith, end quote. The Hebrew writer of Hebrews says in 1036, you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, not by sight, not by sense, not by experience, but by faith. And again, Isaiah thirty fifteen. For thus says the Lord, God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And so may Christ, may our Father, may the Holy Spirit give you confidence that this day, this week, month, and year, whatever He has ordained for you, beloved, is right and good. May He give you that confidence for the future that lies ahead. May He give you confidence that He always does what is best for His church. Give you confidence in His ability to build His church. Give us grace, O Father, to hope and wait quietly for You to rescue us from all our troubles. Help us, Father, because it is hard to quietly hope when our hearts are breaking. We sometimes sing that famous song, How Great Thou Art, and we confess also in song, As Thou Hast Been, Thou Forever Wilt Be. And so may each of us, by God's grace, now as we come to the table of the Lord, willingly submit to our Father. May we never doubt His faithfulness in Christ. May we always remember that He remembers our weaknesses and in response to that, He is full of mercy and kindness and compassion until Christ fully reveals our blessed hope at His appearing. Amen.